Okay, so good morning and welcome to this next installment of our Community Pulse series. My name is Cindy Park and I am uh, happy to uh, introduce uh, our next session. Uh, I am the second vice chair of the Board of Grand Prairie and District Chamber of Commerce and um, we are happy to host um, GPRC today. We acknowledge the Treaty 8 territory and ancestral and ter uh, traditional territory of the Cree, Dene, as well as the Métis. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked the lands for generations. We recognize the land as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on and are visiting. This session is being recorded to share later, so if you have the option of turning off your, your camera, if you wish. There will be time for questions at the end of this session, but if something comes to mind, you can also type it into the chat box or raise your hand, virtual hand and we will try to accommodate you as soon as possible. The Grand Prairie area has a robust and diverse economy. The Community Pulse Series is, the Community Pulse series is designed to provide updates and insights from a variety of our industry sectors and organizations that make up the fabric of our unique and incredible community. We'll be sharing valuable information about our region and the people who make it special over the rest of this month and then resuming again in September. Thank you to our presenting partners, City of Grand Prairie, County of Grand Prairie, um, and the um, Grand Prairie Regional Innovation Network and our supporting partners who are the Chamber Plan represented by local broker Hub International, Community Futures Grand Prairie and Region and get in the Loop Grand Prairie and the Municipal District of Greenview. Today, we were highlighting one of our presenting partners and here's a short video highlighting the role in our community. So Cindy's going to play a little video for us. Maybe. Cindy. Now to introduce this week's presenter, Dr. Glenn Feldman, 
Feltham served as president and CEO of the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, or NATE, from 2011 to 2019 before joining GPRC as interim president and CEO this year. Dr. Feltham has played a leading role in advancing the post-secondary system in Canada and Alberta, serving as chair of Polytechnical Canada, as well as chair of the Council of Post-Secondary Presidents of Alberta. Dr. Feltham holds a number of academic degrees, has professional backgrounds in both law and accounting, and has chaired or served on numerous economic, government, academic, cultural, and social boards. Please welcome Dr. Glenn Feltham. Well, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you uh, today. I, let me uh, talk a little bit about myself, just a little bit more to give you a sense of where I've, I've come from. I am born and raised in Alberta, actually outside Calgary, to a, uh, a very, very entrepreneurial and political family. And uh, so uh, around the kitchen table, we talked business and politics, I think, at every meeting. Uh, every meal. Uh, but I really, really, really loved education. And so I, I've spent my career uh, as a teacher, as a researcher, and as an administrator. Uh, I was blessed to be able to return to Alberta to assume the role of president and CEO of Nate, uh, and uh, retired a short while back, about 16 months ago. Uh, we were supposed to be on a world cruise. And then this COVID thingy hit and uh, I kind of put all of that on the back burner. And so I've been working on a uh, book. And then a few months back, I received uh, a phone call asking if I could uh, step forward and assist Grand Prairie Regional College uh, in a time of transition. And uh, I was absolutely thrilled to be able to say yes. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, being able to speak to a chamber, wow, I've had this opportunity many, many times with many chambers. Uh, I have always enjoyed and, and found it very valuable being part of the chamber uh, movement. I've been on uh, different boards in different cities that I've lived on, chamber boards, and as well as on the national board. So uh, really do appreciate this opportunity. Uh, in terms of my acting role right now. You know, so what is Glenn up to? Well, I'm doing everything I can to learn about this amazing institution, uh, but I'm working with the board to be able to find a next president as well. Uh, and the other thing I'm working with the board on is, is truly understanding the institution and the direction which will allow it to uh, really fulfill its, its purpose and, and possibilities. Uh, I thought what I would chat about today is briefly talk about our changing world. So it's all about change. Uh, changes in post-secondary generally. Uh, changes in Alberta's post-secondary system and then talk about what's happening at GPRC. Uh, so I am gonna move a, a little fast here because uh, I do wanna leave much time for questions. Uh, when I think about the world uh, at large, it really is changing and it's changing faster than it ever has before. We are becoming far faster, flatter, more integrated, and much, much, much more competitive. A lot of that relates back to technological change, but what we're seeing today is a pace of change that was not seen uh, even at the advent of the Industrial Revolution. This is having a profound impact on how post-secondary is operating. So I, I'm gonna throw out a few concepts here, which were never talked about until the last 10 years. And, but these are now dominant. And whenever uh, we look at where institutions need to go and how we meet uh, the needs of learners, these concepts are at the forefront. So the first one is the notion of providing seamless pathways uh, to ensure that any education that is ever taken seamlessly leads to further opportunities that there is full recognition of the learning that is done. And so uh, that's, that's something that as a system, we are very, very much talking about uh, today, how it is we fundamentally make sure that the education uh, that all receive can seamlessly uh, lead to further education. 
I, the second concept that we talk about all the time today is, is lifelong learning. And we kind of used that term before, but it's taking on more meaning. As a matter of fact, when I was at Nate, we came to the realization that certainly within a decade, the majority of the learning that we would be providing would actually be lifelong learning. It would be after people had completed parchments, were successful in a career, and were either taking that additional learning to be able to advance within their career or out of personal interest. And so uh, one of the things that surprised me is when I looked at the programs we were offering at Nate just before I left, uh, we offered 14 sections of blacksmith. And I am reasonably certain that not a single student in those programs was ever intending to become a blacksmith. But the notion of how post-secondary allows us to, uh, to really elevate ourselves and continue to learn both to advance our careers and, and quite frankly, to self-actualize. Another trend is uh, we have always in post-secondary been fixated on parchments. So we talk about getting your degree or certificate or a diploma. Uh, more and more that focus on parchments is lessening. And we're starting to talk about micro-credentials and laddering and how people can take, you know, uh, education in the right size chunks for them. And so what you're gonna see in the next five and 10 years is the nature of offerings in post-secondary are gonna be very different than they are today. Uh, some of these will be very, very short and intense. Uh, all of that though will fit together. Uh, I think the next concept, uh, we are rather a monastic bunch in post-secondary. We've kind of done the same thing or very similar things for the last 500 years. Uh, and we've tended to do it primarily through bankers hours. The notion of being able to get education anytime and anywhere uh, is becoming a dominant theme in all it is that we do. Our historic notion of how it is we learn and learning modes uh, we can all remember our time in post-secondary where there were, you know, however many people in the classroom and the person at the front with his back or her back to you writing on the chalkboard. If you were fortunate, there might actually be multiple colors of chalk. Uh, that is so going away and that's a great thing. Uh, uh, the modalities, whether it's distance, uh, simulation will take a larger and larger role in post-secondary going forward. If you are learning how to spray paint a car, you will be far, far stronger if you have first learned through simulation, getting the exact angles right and the sweeps and all of those things. Or if you're learning to uh, you know, operate uh, cranes and heavy equipment. Uh, but in the medical field, simulation is becoming a dominant form of learning as well as quite frankly, across all disciplines today, including business. Uh, the notion of where we work is also changing. So you're probably hearing that phrase, work integrated learning. That's just a broad concept, uh, which is saying that uh, uh, learning can occur not just within the confines of post-secondary, but on the work site, meaningful work. So uh, everything from co-op to internships to apprenticeship learning, uh, the notion of all students in all programs having uh, meaningful work integrated learning experiences, uh, that's simply becoming where we're going. And finally, I, I would say the last thing that we're seeing in the system is it is increasingly competitive uh, and not just with other post-secondary institutions within your province, country and world, but against a number of different organizations. And so what it will take for us to be successful uh, is we are going to need to be able to compete for students and provide the nature of learning that they need. So those are just some of the dominant changes that we're seeing in post-secondary today. And all of those layer over everything it is that we're doing. Uh, but any institution that can't fundamentally change in a short period of time is gonna struggle with relevance and they're going to struggle to uh, remain in business. So what's happening in, in Alberta in post-secondary? Uh, well, 
uh, for the last nine years, each year, every post-secondary institution in Alberta has had to do more with less. In real terms, in each of the last nine years, irrespective of government, whether it was Conservative or NDP or UCP, uh, the amount of funding in real terms has declined. Uh, the government uh, of the day uh, really took a step back and said, do we fundamentally have a strategy for post-secondary in this province? Uh, and I would say uh, it had been at least 15 to 20 years before a vision and a strategy had really been presented. And much to this government's credit, it has come forward uh, with a vision for post-secondary. And so this is the only reading I'm gonna do in this because I actually think this vision statement is really, really powerful. And it states, Alberta's world-class post-secondary system will equip Albertans with the skills, knowledge, and competencies they need to succeed in their lifelong pursuits. The system will be highly responsive to labor market needs and through innovative programming and excellence in research, contribute to the betterment of an innovative and prosperous Alberta. This vision statement is, is far away from our historic notion and understanding of a post-secondary system as you can get. Uh, it focuses on lifelong learning. It focuses on matching into labor market demand. Uh, it's not just about sitting in a classroom. It's about developing competencies, skills, and knowledge. Uh, in this document, the government goes on and starts to set out a framework for how this is going to be achieved. So I think this has kind of slipped under the radar, but from my perspective, this is one of the most powerful visions I have seen in post-secondary. And uh, you know, for all of those that were involved in getting us to this point, uh, I think it's really powerful. Another thing that's happening in our province, I was uh, incredibly privilege to have the opportunity to co-chair the Skills for Jobs Task Force, which sets out a new apprenticeship structure for the province, uh, which will allow for apprenticeship type education to be used across a whole range uh, of uh, professions. It should allow for a great expansion of that nature of work integrated learning. Uh, and I think will we'll lead to a far stronger and more capable uh, skilled workforce in our province. So that's what's happening in our province. What's happening at GPRC? Uh, we're changing. So I, I'm sure you've all heard that we've gained or are gaining polytechnic status. Uh, May 11th was a truly awesome day, uh, not just for GPRC, but I think for Northwestern Alberta. So what does this polytechnic stuff mean? You know, so fundamentally, what is it going to mean for our city and for our region? Uh, there are a few things people talk about. It allows for degree granting status. Uh, it allows for a far broader range of, of programs. Uh, but uh, when I talk about our system, I talk about three fundamentally different types of post-secondary institutions, polytechnics, universities, and colleges, each serving quite a different purpose. So let me spend maybe five minutes and say, or discuss what I think it means to be a polytechnic. So uh, first of all, I, I think there are four elements to being a polytechnic. The first is the nature of programs. So uh, programs are technology-based, which if you look at the nature of change in our world is right in the sweet spot. So if I look at Nate, SAIT, BCIT, Saskatchewan Polytechnic, uh, you could look at MIT. Uh, what you would find is their programs tend to fall within about four categories. The, the first is uh, science and technology. For example, at Nate, there were 15 engineering technologist programs, uh, everything from environmental to instrumentation. Uh, if one... Uh, so the, a second area is business and entrepreneurship. Throughout much of the world, uh, as a matter of fact, if you eliminate North America, almost all of the world, business education is polytechnic education and is delivered in polytechnic settings. Uh, 
The third thing is the skilled trades. And so for us, apprenticeship-based education is fundamentally polytechnic in nature. And the final thing is the technology side of health. So if we think about health, we have doctors and nurses, and then we have all of those technicians that are critical to developing a health ecosystem and ensuring the nature of outcomes that we need. And quite frankly, it's probably the area with greatest shortage or uh, the greatest number of issues in Northwestern Alberta. So the first thing is polytechnic, the nature of programs, technology-based, and it includes science and technology, it's skilled trades, technology side of health and business and entrepreneurship. The second element of being a polytechnic is the pedagogical method, which is hands-on and experiential. It's fundamentally learning through what you can see and feel and touch. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, I took a number of doctoral level math courses. Uh, I thought I kind of sort of knew stuff fairly well. When I first went to Nate, I spent a few months uh, spending half a day in each program. Uh, and I was in the iron worker program, a few stories above the ground, quite frankly, incredibly nervous, but well tied off. And the instructor asked us all to come down uh, uh, really for a, a little bit of theory. And so it went down and uh, he was introducing a concept, but scratched into the side of a metal vessel were trigonometric functions. And as he explained what it was we were doing above and the math underlying it, for the first time in my life, I had not only memorized trigonometry, I actually understood it. So this notion of learning through what you can see and feel and touch and creating sticky education is fundamentally polytechnic. The third thing is uh, in polytechnics, industry is fundamentally a partner in every single thing it is that the institution does, and it should be. Everything from defining curriculum to you know, helping determine the programmatic mix to meet the, the broader needs of the, the community. Uh, Industry is, is not to be separated from, but fully and absolutely embraced in every single decision. And then the final element of being a polytechnic is the nature of research that is done. Uh, it is not curiosity-based research. It is purely applied and applied in the truest sense of the word. It is industry coming to the institution and saying, if we can solve the following problem, we will be more competitive. Uh, we will be more productive. Uh, so it's purely industry-driven, attempting to move at the speed of industry. In Nate and say most of the applied research program, uh, uh, most of the, the applied research projects are, are like one month to three months. They're not, uh, you know, this five to 25 years. And uh, then the final thing is industry should always hold the intellectual property. So industry comes to us, uh, and usually they're trying to advance and perfect intellectual property. If you need to negotiate for two years over who gets intellectual property, that you've already lost. So if you think of the world's most productive countries, the nature of applied research tend to have those three elements. So what's a polytechnic? Technology-based programs, uh, hands-on education, industry is a partner, and the research is uh, applied. So uh, will we become a polytechnic? Uh, yes, on paper, but we will never be neat and say, nor should we be. Uh, we are going to, my guess is 90% of our new programs will be polytechnic in nature, uh, but we will always have to be a polytechnic plus. Uh, quite frankly, for Nate and say, they do not even consider community. You know, they go, what are the fundamental polytechnic skills needed by people within this province for this province to prosper? That is their only lens. I think for GPRC, we are going to have to focus more broadly as well on meeting other needs of our community. Uh, and uh, uh, I think to the extent we have programs that currently make sense for our community, uh, programs that are successful, we want to expand those and ensure their success into the future. So I, I think we're going to be a little bit of a blend. As I was saying, much of what we will do in the future will be more polytechnic in nature, uh, but we will never abandon our past. 
Uh, what else are we working on? We need to grow like stink. We really, really, really need to grow uh, and ensure our programs align with the needs of our communities and learners. Uh, we are focused right now on new programs. We are going to become infinitely more purposeful in the coming years on ensuring we have a program mix that fundamentally need, meets the needs of, uh, of industry, our communities, and our learners going forward. Uh, this year, we have developed and are starting two new health programs that we know are critical for uh, not just Grand Prairie, but the broader regions that we serve. Uh, we are looking at trying to start two uh, significant degree programs in the next few years. Uh, one that we have in front of the ministry right now is a Bachelor of Computer Science. The second program that we are just in the process of, of finalizing to send off to the ministry is a Bachelor of Business Administration. We fundamentally believe that this institution needs a business school with a full, with a full range of programs that will allow it to elevate what it is doing in the, in the, the broader business area. So I want to close just by talking about uh, how it is we're going to be reaching out. Uh, so I spent last week in my RV tooling around our broader region, I, almost like a Johnny Cash song. You know, I went to Edson, Hinton, Jasper, Grand Cash, you know, uh, through Grand Prairie to Fairview, Valley View. Uh, yes, I am going to get that in a song. Uh, if nothing else, it'll be a brilliant limerick. Uh, but uh, uh, we are doing far broader engagement and connection back to our communities has to become a huge hallmark for us in a hurry. We are starting with some uh, uh, engagement activities. We are surveying the communities we serve right now. Uh, these are attitudinal surveys. We want to know two things, what people know about us and what people think about us. Uh, do we expect the results will be brilliant? Not at all. Do we think it'll provide really good baseline data that allows us to understand the nature of gaps between where we believe we need to be and how we are currently perceived and understood? Yeah, it, it's going to be critical that we do this. Uh, fairly soon, we're going to be coming out and we're going to be talking about our naming and identity. And so uh, uh, that's going to be kind of cool as well. We will have the minister uh, join us as well, uh, probably in the early fall, uh, when uh, uh, we formally become uh, a polytechnic uh, institute. So we're going to have a number of activities there. And then we're going to focus back on truly learning from each community we serve uh, what those fundamental needs are and, and how we can ensure those are met. Uh, I do believe great organizations evolve. Uh, we are so incredibly blessed to have the nature of facilities and the people that we have at GPRC. And we are so looking forward to becoming uh, stronger, to being able to work with our community and uh, to see that, uh, that future unfold as, as we know it can. So uh, that essentially was what I wanted to chat about. And I really, really look forward to your questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, we do have some time for questions. And uh, if you want to raise your hand or put your comments in or question in the chat box, we will um, call you by name and you can unmute yourself. Um, before we do that, I, do, I guess, please go ahead and do that. And I'm going to ask a, a question or two. But first, I have a comment. I'm one of those old bankers and bankers hours are now seven days a week. <laughs> so I know. But, but we never got the we never got the story. Uh, it, it, it is interesting, though. Given you come from banking, uh, even if we talk about apprenticeship and that, if you live, for example, in the northern cantons in Switzerland, you cannot become a banker if you didn't apprentice as a banker. So, so the notion of of work integrated learning and how how far and how fundamentally we can change the world of work. It, th these are very very cool times. 
So uh, thank you, Glenn. Um, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Ryan has his hand raised, and oh, then we'll go to Mike after. And then Mike. Ryan. Okay, very good. You're talking to me? <laughs> uh, thank you, Cindy. Or Mike, if you'd like to go first. No, Talk. you go ahead. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Glenn, thank you very much. I thought that was a really great overview of uh, Polytechnic, the way you sort of broke that out into the various parts. Um, if there's time for a second question, I'd like to get a little bit more insight into the various skills, labor development sort of task force throughout the province. Um, some with the, the Council of Presidents and ACC, there's some government stuff and business councils working on some, yep. but sort of tied to that as a next step. I'm really interested in uh, micro-credentialing. So the province yep. recently has come out um, advocating very strongly for micro-credentialing. You talked about sort of viewing the landscape differently, but you know, when you go online, for example, I was just researching this the other day, the current Alberta credential framework um, neglects to mention at all micro-credentialing. And um, I'm having a difficult time getting maybe a consistent definition of one, the term, how the ministry would view it, and, and then specifically, how is this going to affect not only polytechnics and universities, but uh, corporations where there's professional skills development that are happening outside of academia, our agency in, is involved in that. And um, I'm curious about that landscape. Hi, sure. So let me start by saying the credential framework is terribly disappointed, disappointing in so many ways. It's hard to even know where to start. But, uh, but yes, it doesn't reflect all sorts of education that is currently taken, how that's going to ladder, what all of that, that means. But quite frankly, you could be a journey person, having done three years of education, having run a business, uh, being at a very, very high level. And uh, being a skilled journey person is not reflected in our credentials framework. In other words, you're given credit, essentially, of having had zero education. Uh, so at Nate, when we introduced the trades to degree program, where if you were a journey person, you could enter the third year of the business program, uh, the students excelled. Uh, as a matter of fact, they blew away the students that started in year one of the business school and, and worked its way through. So the, uh, on the micro-credential side, uh, you know, there's an awful lot of things that need to catch up, including the, the credential framework in, in some ways we may almost be better off tossing out a lot of this stuff rather than trying to fix it. Uh, but uh, uh, there are jurisdictions, for example, uh, New Zealand, that uh, have truly been quite innovative uh, and have taken uh, uh, micro-credential type frameworks to their logical extension, which is, you know, these are just fundamentally building blocks and you need to be able to stack these building blocks and and just look across uh, the nature of education a person's received and providing other parchments. Uh, we have to get there and we have to get there in a hurry because it's what our learners are expecting. Uh, and uh, if we don't figure it out, uh, uh, learners will get their education in different ways. And so... Uh, Glenn, just a follow on question to that, Mike, uh, if you could permit me on that. Um, so the federal Alberta job grant program, which you're yep. likely aware of professional skills development, yep. Yep. the nature of that criteria is, is quite flexible. And it seems to me that what they do is the program says we will leave the credentialing rather or the so long as the business has identified the training program, that's all we need. The, the business yep. is looking to professionally develop their their employees and this is the program they've selected that's a good enough criteria or parameter do you view potentially micro credentialing leaning more in that direction or um, again so just uh, your thoughts on that and i'll cede the floor to mike hi do you know some i think it's going to cut across everything it's going to cut across so uh, what i would say is historically if you were in a large university and i uh, you were taking economics and did a calculus course, it would probably not count towards your calculus course if you then switched to business. In other words, there was never any recognition of anything even within an institution. So, and by and large, the world has not moved that far away from, from that in terms of, of recognition. On the micro-credential side, uh, we need recognition 
within an institution, across institutions, and between post-secondary and non-post-secondary. So long as there are clearly defined outcomes and those can be demonstrated, those should be recognized and allow a person to seamlessly continue that education. So when I talk about pathways, uh, for me, uh, all of these things are kind of intertwined, but not only the expectations of learners, but the reasonable expectations of learners. And, and fundamentally what we need to expect is that full recognition of whatever learning is taken in however that is, is recognized. What's interesting on the micro-credential side is some people are arguing uh, that even that may not matter because a micro-credential is still a credential. Uh, you know, we may evolve to the point where it just becomes people being able to demonstrate they have certain competencies. And so uh, uh, this is a, a wonderful time to be involved in post-secondary education if you love change and can imagine uh, very broad outcomes that may occur, but uh, uh, post-secondary is gonna to have to be nimble in ways it has never before been. Uh, both in timeliness, in being willing to look at things in different ways. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating time. I, and would love to come back and, and talk with you even offline if you would like on your first question. Thank you, uh, uh, Glenn. That was uh, an amazing description. I'd never heard uh, Polytech technic is uh, in your description. Uh, and it's very clear that you're following a vision, which I didn't understand. Now I do. Yeah. And so I answered the survey and I took exception to renaming uh, yep. the college. And, yep. and I, after listening to you speak today, I realized I have erred in my thinking. And then maybe we need to have a fresh look and, uh, uh, and, and what is leading that is there's always a cost in changing the name. Yep. And, yep. Uh, and so I'll let you answer that. And I have a couple other follow ups. So. Absolutely. I, I, I think at an absolute minimum, uh, we need to reflect that our status has changed. And uh, so I think the word polytechnic or technical institute or something indicating that the nature of, of where we fall within the act and what our future aspirations are for programming, it needs to be reflected. Uh, I also think we need to think about how we define ourselves geographically. Uh, I think when we talk with people within Grand Prairie versus people outside Grand Prairie, uh, are we Grand Prairie's institution? Are we an institution for the Northwest of our province or for uh, whatever that is? Uh, the other thing I would say though, is it is very, very rare that a post-secondary institution ever gets a chance to reinvent itself uh, and bring everyone along and understand everything it is that institution can do for you know, the communities it serves for industry and, and for, for learners. And, and so uh, I think there is a, an incredible opportunity here and uh, uh, quite frankly, I, I hope that the board chooses to be uh, bold in what they do, but we are going to listen very, very broadly. And I know with certainty that there will be people all the way from, you know, if the name changes, the world comes to an end to, uh, you know, I can't imagine, you know, anything but uh, Bodie McVoteface. You guys know the story there, don't you? From Odie McBoatface. Uh, if not, please look it up. It's it's what happened when uh, uh, the British uh, Maritime Research Organization uh, asked people to comment and, and actually allowed them to vote on what the name of their new vessel should be. Uh, so. so uh, ultimately, the board will make the decision, but they are really, really going to be looking for input. Yeah. So the 
the third and fourth parts of that is that I'm concerned. I was concerned about the cost of the name change, but now I realize, okay, get out of your old hat, throw that away, and let's let's market to the world because basically that's what we're going to be doing. Yeah. So yes. the second part is my concern about the government's pension over the last 10 years to cut, 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 and do more with less. And at some point in time, you got to stop the bleeding. And uh, I'll let you answer that. And then my last part, I'll, I'll just add on to that. I, you know, I, I think the realities economically in our province, in our country, and in, in our world is that what's happened in Alberta is not different from what's happened throughout much of the world. As a matter of fact, the nature of reductions in countries like Australia, New Zealand, uh, England were far, far more significant. And, and so they have actually been more gradual here that, that have partially allowed us to adjust. I, I think the notion of, uh, to be perfectly honest, we're less than half the size we need to be to meet the needs of our communities. I think, you know, and, and that is, that's modest. Uh, so I think we can easily be two to three times the size we are now. And I think wow. we are quite financially sustainable if we actually have the nature program mix, if we're attracting students the way we can, if we have the right strategies around international students and everything else. So I, I think that there is an incredible opportunity for us to grow. And, and I, think, I, I think if I was the government, I would be doing the simple division and saying, how much money are we giving you? How many students do you have? Divide one by the other. Does this make sense? And uh, I think it makes an awful lot more sense if we have far more students. Yes, yeah. And my last part, and, uh, and it has to do with uh, community connection. And in the survey, I brought that up. And yeah. it's very important that the theater is the most beautiful theater, but in, yeah. in, in uh, one way, it's a financial albatross around the neck of the college. And, uh, but I think the community is being punished because they're trying to recoup the cost for the community groups. I'm saying put some value on what the community involvement needs to be. And we need to be able to say, okay, let's fill it. Let's have the community use it. And let's make sure we're not bankrupting the small little groups that need to go in there. I, so on our theater, uh, uh, we've been aggressively stupid in what we've done. Uh, and that, uh, that theater should be used at least five nights a week. Uh, uh, we have a person coming in to help us assess who's going to work with the different groups in the, the city and, and the broader community to understand the nature of programming that will really elevate our, our community. Uh, we are going to have to work through a financial model. It's going to make sense for certain types of activities. We are not going to be charging. Uh, but if we bring in Kissel, you know, for four country music concerts, uh, we certainly will. Uh, but uh, in a past life, I was chair of Canada's Royal Winnipeg Ballet. And uh, uh, our executive director at that time had come from Cirque du Soleil is now retired. Uh, he's actually gonna be here next week, starting to really think about how we can start to use our facilities in the ways that uh, will elevate our community and make financial sense. So absolutely agree with you, Mike. Uh, there's not a chance in the world that we can let these assets sit idly. It's not good for our institution. It's not good for our community. It's just stupid. So uh, we're working on that. Thank you so much. Thanks for your questions, Mike. Does anyone else have any questions? While we see and watch for uh, the chat box or your hands up, I have a couple other questions for you, Mike. Yeah. Um, this is the second time I've heard your comments about being two to three times larger uh, yeah. in, in coming years, which is absolutely exciting and wonderful for this community and um, changing the way we do business essentially is really going to be remarkable for the college. Um, I wanted to ask you about the health side. So you talked about potential new health programs. Do you know what kind of programs that could um, 
be involved in that and how the new hospital will be connected to that. Sure. Uh, so uh, I, we are now offering licensed practical nurse and uh, I forget what the other one is, uh, uh, are being offered, I think, starting this upcoming year. Uh, but uh, from my perspective, we really need to look on uh, the allied side of health. So uh, the, the most, the, the biggest constraint in, in healthcare education is not related to what post-secondary can do in, in educating students, but relates to clinical placements. Uh, one of the things I did when I was out visiting all the different communities was try to figure out how we can elevate different health facilities uh, in such a way that we can gain far more clinical placements and produce far more healthcare specialists for Northwestern Alberta. Uh, when I look at the new hospital, there are two or three elements I love about that. First of all, on the simulation side, uh, we're gonna have world-class simulation space, uh, which elevates both the nature of education that can be offered, uh, but particularly on the allied side. So. Uh, I know that our VP academic is really going to be focused back on understanding the nature of programming that will work in health. Uh, she comes from the health side herself, having been the Dean of Health. Uh, uh, so uh, I know Vanessa is, is keenly interested uh, in this. I think, uh, uh, I think there are, uh, probably at least a handful of programs on the allied self uh, on the allied self side that will make sense. One of the reasons that's as important as it is though is uh, where it are where it is that you are educating uh, within this region, uh, it makes it far easier to attract other medical professionals if the infrastructure is in place and the other people are in place to allow that to be successful. So uh, uh, I, I don't know whether something like respiratory therapist makes sense or, you know, uh, it, certainly on the uh, testing side, probably, you know, makes sense, uh, uh, you know, on, on the EMT side and that, uh, but, uh, but that's where uh, my PhD is in accounting. And you don't get more profoundly ignorant of health than Glenn, but fortunately we have people that are exceptionally both knowledge and passionate about it. But I do know we're gonna to have to focus back on the clinical placement side. And I think that will really, really have a powerful impact on communities. That's good to hear. We do have some shortages for sure in particular areas in our healthcare system in the north. And, uh, you know, radiology is an example of one of those. And hopefully those sorts of things can really make a difference here. And it actually will attract, um, you know, professionals in, in you know, physicians and uh, specialists once we have that, those services available. So Absolutely. that's good too. Mm -hmm. um, I have one more question around industry. So there is yes. a huge focus around AI. Yep. And uh, do you see that this polytechnic will uh, adapt to including programs around that? So I guess what I would say is um, uh, AI is becoming ubiquitous. It is going to have to be in virtually everything it is that we do if we think about technological transformation and that. What I can't see is I can't see, uh, quite frankly, we will never be able to, to compete. No one in Canada will be able to compete, notwithstanding what the University of Alberta believes, uh, with certain other jurisdictions in the world in terms of the creation of advanced AI type platforms and that. So for us, it has to be, how do we empower industry to adopt technology in the way that will make them more productive? So I, I don't know that we will be producing people to have AI firms, but it's going to become critical that uh, an understanding of uh, how AI can be brought into different structures and processes, uh, 
you know, if you think about where it's being used now, uh, an awful lot of it is in areas like business. So it's in uh, accounting and uh, uh, taxation. And so, so, so I guess what I would say is we're going to have to be very thoughtful about uh, how we bring certain knowledge concepts across our programs uh, uh, so that learners can truly understand how it will impact them and how they can use these tools to be more effective in what it is they do. Uh, pure AI programs, probably not. Can you? But once again, not my expertise and smarter, <laughs> and smarter people will make those decisions. You know, it's interesting in Fort McMurray, um, they have a lot of engineers, of course, with the heavy oil uh, out there. And actually some of the major companies are retraining their engineers to involve AI um, specialty. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the, the notion of taking engineers and, and, and giving them different tools. Yeah. But, but for me, that's moving from quills to pens. Uh, it, it's it's not, uh, but far more transformational, for example, up in Fort McMurray is uh, the replacement of drivers with uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. And so their new trucks are autonomous and it's changed everything. It's changed how big the roads need to be, the fact they can run them 24 seven, the fact that they can run them 12 feet apart as opposed to a few hundred yards apart. Uh, even on the repair side, it's probably cost them about a third of what it was costing before because people are crappy at driving relative <laughs> to uh, technology. And so uh, it, it is, it, so all of these things that are happening, I, I think we're not even under, fully comprehending the nature of what is happening out there right now. And, uh, but you're absolutely right. How it is, this also gets the lifelong education side. Uh, lifelong education programs where people can come in and take two or three courses in how to adopt, you know, uh, AI tools and that into what it is they do. Uh, those things will make huge sense. So uh, uh, we are going to have to become lifelong learners. Uh, whether or not we like it, it will be a, a, an increasing necessity. We'll have to train the people that can't drive, for example, too, so. Absolutely. Tanya, please go ahead. Awesome, thanks, Cindy. Thanks so much for joining us today, Glenn. It was uh, so great to hear from you and get the update. And I'm really excited about where post-secondary is going in the province and where GPRC is going here. And I think there's just a really incredible opportunity for our chamber to work even closer with GPRC than ever before and do what we do best and you know act as that connector between our business community and between post-secondary to really help solve that problem of how do we connect the right opportunities with the right students. And um, if you can comment a little bit on what Ryan alluded to with the provincial task force, um, I'm really um, excited and encouraged by that partnership with the Alberta Chambers of Commerce um, and COPOA. I'm honored to sit on that task force representing our chamber um, and one of the three community chambers across the province. And it's a really interesting mix of people around the table to just help um, solve this problem of, of the connection between the students and the business and, uh, and how do we do that? So I'd love to hear your thoughts. So, so on the skills for job uh, task force, uh, I kind of structured the report in different areas. So we first of all started in the non-apprenticeship area and some of what I told you a little earlier about uh, work integrated learning has to be central to education. Uh, I guess we've always known that people learn far, far better. It is far better for employers. It is far better for the learner. It's just better for everyone where a significant amount of learning occurs actually at the workforce. Uh, so uh, we worked through that. We worked through structures and expectations around what post-secondary should be doing. And then we really move into this new apprenticeship system. Uh, very shortly, the province will be approving new apprenticeships. Forget all the language you ever heard. So things like the journeyman, now journey person, it, that may make sense, all of that vernacular in the skilled trades where it's time honored and that language 
really, really, really resonates. Uh, if you're in IT, you're probably not going to want to be called a journey person. You know, and, and so, you know, there will be IT professional designations uh, where your learning can be through an apprenticeship model. There will be, uh, but uh, uh, right now we have 47 apprenticeable trades uh, in our province. Uh, the average in uh, sort of the Germanic world, and incidentally, Germany is the worst at the Germanic system, but uh, the, the average in the Germanic system is about 300. Uh, so how it is we have educated for a long time, and everything is seamless in terms of pathway. So let me just end on one story here. Uh, I was meeting with the uh, Minister of Education and Post-Secondary Education for the northernmost canton in Switzerland. So purely Germanic in, uh, in this particular part of Switzerland. Uh, she was telling me, I think it was 83% of all learners did an apprenticeship. And she said, most of the other 17 are not Swiss. So they're coming from other places. And the notion of having their, their children begin a real job at age 15 just seems strange to them. So virtually everyone that is Swiss actually goes through that. Uh, this minister had three kids. All three of them did an apprenticeship, uh, one in automotive, one in welding, and one, I think it was, in finance or banking. Uh, Two of them today are professors, one at Zurich and one at NYU. Uh, only their daughter decided to continue with that trade. Uh, she's the mechanic. Uh, so uh, you were no further behind for having done an apprenticeship. You took the identical math courses. You took the identical language courses. There was the way you may have learned those materials were different. So as we were doing the, the task force and as we really looked at best practice around the world and we learned an awful lot from different countries, we tried to partially capture that vision. Uh, the distance between where we are and where the world's most productive countries are on the development of skills, when those are developed, how those are developed, how those are supported, how those are recognized, it is a chasm. It, uh, and so it, it was our hope that we could start to change legislative frameworks uh, and then start to build in a way that would make Alberta fundamentally more competitive and would allow our learners to uh, uh, have the strongest possible foundation for life. So this notion of, of building uh, a foundation for an outstanding career uh, for us was, was critical. The very last thing, uh, I spent most of my career in large medical doctoral universities. You know, we always said that, you know, you were coming to us to find yourself. Well, quite frankly, at Nate, we said, you know, that's fine, but come to us once you've found yourself once you fundamentally know what it is you're doing. In my last year at Nate, uh, the majority of students coming already had a parchment in hand, already had degrees. Uh, we had 900 students come in with graduate degrees, including 300 with PhDs. Uh, this notion of fundamentally elevating and continuing to gain that knowledge and foundation for a career, I, I think is is kind of central both to where the task force was going uh, as well as where we are and is very consistent with that vision that was brought forward by the government of Alberta, which I think is very cool. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Feltham. Uh, in the interest of time, we're two minutes over. So um, I'm sorry, we won't be able to take any more questions, but I did want to close. Um, and I wanted to also mention, I love the term Polytechnic Plus for our new college. And I think that will be a really exciting um, opportunity for, for this region. Um, 
I want to thank you again, Dr. Feltham, uh, for joining us today. And I want to thank everyone who participated and again, acknowledge all our partners, including our presenting partners, the City of Grand Prairie, the County of Grand Prairie, the Grand Prairie Regional Innovation Network and supporting partners, the Chamber Plan represented by local broker Hub International, Community Futures Grand Prairie and Region, Get in the Loop Grand Prairie and the Municipal District of Greenview.